Welcome everyone. Welcome Vikings to yet another weekly Valhalla for Artists lecture. This is as usual Misha speaking and today we're talking about all things money, freelance and monetization for visual development artists. But if you're a creative of any other field, you know, you could also find this lecture useful because concepts that I'll be talking about are pretty universal and could be applied almost to any creative work of life, right? In this guide, right, we'll, I'll provide a step-by-step -step approach to monetizing your art and um, your creative skill with a particular focus on visual development artists. I will cover everything from understanding how money works in the entertainment industry to practical tips for freelancing. Um, yeah, be sure to grab a pen and a paper and take notes. I also recommend getting you, you know, getting your favorite meat out, your Viking drink, you know, of choice and in front of you. And then, uh, yeah, because we're gonna spend uh, quite a quite a bit of time to. Uh, today together uh, it's, a, it's a chunky it's a chunky lecture my goal is that at the end of this guide you should have a solid understanding of the fundamentals of like monetizing your creative career and all the all other things freelance related um, and also uh, I, I want to make sure that you can take actionable steps so you can continue doodling and working on your art stories and creative voices right so yeah, without further ado, let's start our lecture. Today's lecture name is, you know, how to monetize your art, the ultimate beginner's guide, right? So here's how you monetize your creative work, or here's how monetization of creativity works. And I even have slides prepared today, right? The most important concept that you have to grasp, grasp is that entertainment industry is a business. And sadly, just like all businesses, majority of companies exist in our field just to be profitable. There were times where animation or gaming companies made money just to continue doing like what they're doing for the art sakes, right? For the, for the art form. But these days, all big companies have investors and shareholders. Our artistic part of the process is just a tool to get money. But it's not priority, sadly. And, you know, we can... We can think that it's sad, but that's the reality of, of, today's, of today's industry. Uh, we can discuss how we can change that maybe in another lecture. Um, and currently, there's two types of modern gold, value and attention. Uh, value and attention, and, and attention. Like we all watch YouTube or Netflix, and in exchange for our attention, advertisers, well, they pay money to those platforms or subscribers pay, uh, or subscribers pay like their monthly fee, right? Or if a gaming, gaming company is released new content in a video game, it could be their promotional animations to get their players back into the game or new patch in the game to encourage players to buy the new skins. Game is the attention grabber and systems in place for transactions is the monetizing tool. But attention is the key again here, right? I think the best example for attention is the animation industry itself. Um, <laughs> back in my days, people used to go like to the theater to watch a movie. But uh, you know, movies the content. Our attention is the main currency on how successful that movie will be. Um, value, you know, because again, it's value and attention that is the main currency right now. Um, and you know what? I think I forgot my next slide. One second, guys. Doink. Doink. There you go. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, yeah. Value also works in a similar way, but in slightly more diverse way. Uh, like, for example, we, we buy a toothbrush paired already with a toothpaste. That's value of convenience. We watch a streamer or hire a therapist, we get our emotional value of reliability or understanding why we are feeling a certain way. I like, you know, there's, I can go forever with progressively dumber examples, but the bottom, like the bottom line is this, right? The bottom line is this, you can sell or monetize anything as long as people see value in it. The real question then becomes how much and to how many? It's just in our world, majority of value is delivered through attention. And, you know, even better statement for me personally is this. You dedicate yourself to solving a problem in the world. More important, the problem and better you are at solving it. 
well, more money people will be willing to pay to solve it. Visual development artists in general, right? Well, we usually work in the attention department. We make sure projects that hire us get things on time, you know, um, at a high quality and with a justifiable price. Uh, and that's the classic freelance value triangle, right? Money, quality, time. Um, companies, they make millions of their content and they pay millions to produce it. Every time we get hired, we need to understand who is hiring us, what is their budget, how much money company is making and how valuable it is to them. More valuable it is to them, more we can charge, right? So you should always think about the, the value triangle. Um, the general rule of thumb, and this is how to use the value triangle, is this. If they want more quality, right, and faster turnarounds, if they want more quality and faster turnarounds, well, what does it mean? Well, you can, you can charge a higher price. Uh, if they want more quality and for cheaper, well, that means more time, and time is money for most companies. So this is usually the indie company route, right? But not all of them. Um, in AAA companies, they usually want fast and high quality. So that means equals high day rate. Right. So for a majority of AAA freelancers, they, they, their day rate can go up to like, I don't know, $65, $75 an hour. I know people who get all the way up to like $1,000 a day. And that's the same, that, that's the same thing, right? Uh, they provide incredible value in a short amount of time. That's why they get in, paid a lot. It's not that they get paid incredible amount of money because of their status or experience, it's all about value, right? Remember, value and attention is the currency that we operate with. Um, yeah, it's it's very important to understand this, right? And then like number one thing to avoid is if they want high quality, super fast and cheap, you don't take that job. You're ignore, you, you ignore it for the sake of other artists, right? Uh, because, or it's going to be like super low quality, super expensive and possibly with deadlines prolonged, right? Uh, because we don't take those clients on, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's better to do high quality in less time for a lot of money or, you know, high quality, a little bit longer time with a little bit less money. But then if, if all three are there, you like, you don't take that job on. Um, yeah, yeah. Probably to recap what I just said is, you know, um, like this is very important concepts to understand because if you're planning to do art full time or any creative endeavor in general, because even if we have the purest intentions in the world and we want just to create, we have to understand how the world works to actually continue doing it or just go in the mountains, you know, stick a tunnel with spoons and hopes to find gold <laughs> and, you know, and, and just sponsor our career with that. Um, and it's not very, you know, practical. Uh, just to recap, you know, we charge for value provided. Price depends on company's earnings and how valuable it is to the company. We provide modern gold, right, which is attention through art. And we're always conscious of our time, quality, and speed when working for the client because that's the that's what determines our price, right? Again, if an uh, indie company comes to you and they make, I don't know, $20,000 a year off their game, they're not going to have a multi-thousand dollar budget for their tiles, for example, for, for, for their video game. And every time a new client comes to you, you have to understand what value am I providing? What, uh, you know, what problem am I solving? And how much does it, you know, uh, how much they're willing to pay because, you know, how valuable it is to them. All right. And, you know, in general, uh, money, <laughs> money and, you know, money and art, they always coexisted. You know, in the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo had the Medici family and the Catholic Church, right? And they were sponsoring all the endeavors. Uh, da Vinci even did some uh, weaponry designs as concept artists, basically, uh, for, for, you know, for a lot of cities. And he, he designed a lot of stuff. Michelangelo not only did paintings for Catholic Church, but he also did commissions in terms of like statues. Um, and then there was, uh, what are those guys? Yeah, there's Tesla and Edison, and they had the Morgan family and then the Vanderbilt family back in their visions and inventions. Uh, I think what I'm trying to say with this is that 
Um, you know, money was always a tool for artists and visionary creatives to, you know, to fund and to, to fund and support their lifestyle. And it's easier these days than ever. I think I think we live in the most awesome time in history of all humanity because we can find those clients, companies and audience and provide value directly to them through social media and Internet. And back in the days, well, you had to be exceptional <laughs> to get discovered. These days, it's much, much more easier because of, in, of the Internet, social media and all that stuff. Um, like artists have the power to create and the only thing they need is a little bit of understanding how, you know, uh, who they work for and how value and attention works. Right. And I'll explain it a little bit later. And yes, compromise is needed sometimes to make our art sell better in general. But I truly believe that we can combine the two and find a sweet spot without sacrificing our creative voices. You know, it takes time and dedication, but I truly believe it's possible. So if you want, you know, so if you want, if you won't find a solution to your problem in this lecture, uh, trust me, if you, if you just think about the constants that I'm talking about here, you can forge your own path in your career, just implementing, you know, the theory that I'm talking about here. All right. So we kind of understand how money works ish, right? Right. Because we, we manipulate two things, value and attention. If we, if we have the people's attentions, right, they're going to, they're going to, advertisers are going to pay or they're going to subscribe to Netflix and everything else, or they could play a game. Value is if we can do it fast enough, high quality enough, and, you know, uh, value of convenience and all of that stuff. Uh, and the main question is like, what do you guys monetize, right? And right now I'm going to speak probably, you know, a little bit generally, not only to visual development artists, and this is my own take on what you should monetize. And it goes something like this, right? Every person has a God-given talent, right? And ability is to be like good at a specific thing or even multiple things. All you have to do is live life and follow your interests and you'll eventually find it one step at a time. Not every path is the same and there's one rule that you should keep in mind and this is like, it's this, you don't settle for less, okay? You don't settle for less. What does it mean? Well, that means you keep moving in search of your why and passion. And that means the moment you feel that you're not learning and not moving forward and doesn't benefit your journey, you need to find a new next building block for your career, which is um, like with this attitude, you'll always find your way to your calling and, you know, and you'll be in the right spot at the right time doing what you love and also working with and for the people you respect and admire. Like to illustrate this point a little bit better, um, I'm gonna quote uh, an amazing <laughs> fictional person, Bilbo Baggins, right? And it goes something like this. It's a dangerous business, Frodo, going out of your door. You step into the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. And I think that's a perfect metaphor of how your art career might go before you even monetize or many years after you do. Your career is, is a forever changing and morphing destination. And that will, it will only make sense on your deathbed as you look back at it, right? When I look at my art career right now in general, I would have never known that I would have ended up in a place where I'm at now, you know, lecturing and talking to you guys. And it still doesn't make sense. And again, it's a forever morphing thing. And if you follow your passion and the things that interest you, you might find yourself in the most amazing and ridiculous place because that's the positive outcome of, you know, following your passion and, and the things that you're good at. Um, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to dive a little bit into a biography of one specific dude, you know, uh, one famous composer, uh, like I think he illustrates that perfectly, right? So let's let's let, let's watch a little movie, almost, right? Let's watch a little movie. Um, it's 1957, Frankfurt, West Germany. A little boy, you know, <laughs> uh, he just you know he just lost 
his father not too long ago. He was kicked out of a musical school. Uh, and he finds music as again as a you know a way to cope with his grief. And then a few years later, he joins like many weird music groups as a synth piano player. And then you know he releases single albums, does gigs at the bars, like selling his you know personal CDs, and then even pitching some Christmas jingles for like TV commercials and stuff. But then an interesting opportunity presents itself to him. You know, uh, director heard you know one of his solo composed singles and invites him to do the main score for this little movie called the rain man i'm not sure if you saw it it's a movie about uh an interesting um you know special man with i would say it's down syndrome but you know especially special minded person and you know the only reason that the director even heard of this guy is because his wife was listening to the cd in the kitchen that a friend of a friend brought from the bar, you know, uh, you know, and when he got hired by this director, this project was a crucial stepping stone that led him to work on projects like Pirates of the Caribbean, Gladiator, 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 <laughs> Prince of Egypt, Inception, Interstellar, Dark Knight Rises, The Lion King, and I think The Dune, that was his latest one. And, you know, many, many more from that. And you probably guessed his name by now, you know. Uh, this composer's name is... What is his name? Oh, whoops. That's the, that's the next slide. Where's the next slide? Ta-da! <laughs> the next slide is... His name is Hans Zimmer, right? Um, yeah. I'm, like, I'm sure he didn't know where he would end up from the start. But he followed his inner passion and interest to life. And he ended up, well, where he's now. His love for computers, because he was he was in love with technology, and love for music was combined and then found a, a creative outlet, which is, was, you know, c cinematic composing for movies, right? And he liked movies, of course. And then, you know, his voice resonated with the director's wife first in the kitchen. And then he got, you know, he got the... The gig from the director like i hope you get the point that i'm trying to convey here right like all it takes is one chance one open door and your life could change forever but you need to build the skill set before and be ready for when that moment comes right that's that's all you're doing when you're studying that's all you're doing you're trying to prepare you for that for that moment and then lay on the brick for those opportunities to come to you right through your good work all right, let's continue. Let's continue. Let's get better. It gets better. Promise me. Promise me. I promise you. All right, so what are the first steps that you need to take to start monetizing your art or any creative skill set the fastest? Number one, find direction in life uh, because this will lead you like... If you find your direction line, this will lead you to the closest thing that you're good at. It can evolve over time, so don't be afraid. Just take a path and stick to it. But do find the one thing that excites you, you know, makes your heart tickle, <laughs> keeps the spark going and stick to it. Uh, I think that is your fastest way to monetization and earning a living from it. Think of it as a Skyrim, you know, skill tree. It takes a while to level up everything. So your best bet is to invest everything into one skill and use that to gain this valuable resource called money. Like, don't worry, other skills will come along, but at the right time and at the right moment, your goal is to find your voice as an artist and then find what the job market has to offer. Not that, not the other way around, okay? I can repeat it again. This is really important. Your goal is to find your voice as an artist and then find what the job market has to offer, not the other way around. This is very important. So you don't get stuck in a creative hell working for a company you don't like, in a style you don't like, just because it was easier to get in there. All right? Probably out of this whole lecture, this is the most important moment. Right. Number two. Understand your reason for monetization slash getting a job. You need to understand that money won't solve all of your problems. Personally, I make money and freelance to buy myself more time 
to invest into my personal art and develop meaningful connections and practice my storytelling skills for my animation series along the way and without the distractions, okay? Plus, it's going to help me out when I'm going to make my own animation studio. That's why I freelance. That's why I make money. Know your why. Understand why you need to monetize. Because in my opinion, purest form of art when it's not involved with money. My mom is this way. She's a pure artist. She creates for her own sake as a pure expression. But if we want to continue doing it as a job, we need to find ways to monetize. And that's why this lecture is all about here right now. Right? Like, and me getting jobs, you know, it comes as a side effect of me loving what I do and being good at it. And I'm at a place in my career right now where I can say no to some to some of the jobs, you know, and I'm very blessed that, you know, I can call almost all of my clients' friends. If, for example, I knew that working in the industry would not be beneficial to my voice as an artist and my goals to make my own animation studio and project, I would, I would have went the indie route and still worked on a day job building my dream through other things. And I would have found money in other fields, right? Because your creative voice and what you do is so important that again, money isn't everything in life. You can, you can always make more money, but you cannot make more time. So if you could somehow, you know, stick to your thing and then not worry too much about monetization, you know, maybe you were born with a million dollars. That's probably very unlikely. But if you could stick to your thing and then find your own route, do it, right? If, if, if the classical way is not for you in terms of classic monetization, classic, you know, freelancing and then, the, and then going to the industry, that is totally fine, you know, as long as you understand how value and attention system works. When you find the thing that you're good at and you understand why you need to monetize it, right? And then you found your direction in life, right? It's time to stick and double down on that thing. You need to become good at it. Uh, and that's like number three. Number three now, you need to become good at it, like real good at it. You have to obsess over it, dedicate yourself to that thing and educate yourself about that thing on a daily basis and continue double checking with your inner voice. But remember, to answer one question, always remember, right? What problems am I solving and whose life am I going to make easier, right? I'm going to repeat it again. Double check with your inner, inner voice. Are you on the right path or not? And then ask these questions, right? What problems am I solving? And whose life am I going to make easier? This is a golden rule, at least in my career, right? Number five or number four, you know, you take, you, you, you take track, you know, make friends along the way of similar interests because that is your first, you know, network for the industry news and updates, and you never know where that can lead because, you know, our industry is all about, I know a guy who knows a guy. Uh, make sure you know, you know, you know your tribe. And one of the things that I posted on Twitter the other day is know your tribe, because this is very important. People who are in the voice chat right now with me, you know, friends is everything. It's your support system. It's your good juju. <laughs> good juju fuel and that will help you to actually survive friends and connections make or break an artist because it's really really hard to push on your own and it takes it takes an extra uh, what, a, what, what do I want to say it, it takes extra effort like I remember when I was I was freelancing and being on this journey by myself in the trailer and no one understood me and it was really, really hard. So I built a community for myself, a half artist, right? Now it's a little bit easier. Um, and then, yeah, I found my own community back in the days also on Discord and that's why I'm doing this thing right now. So you can find buddies and, you know, push on with them. All right, number five, I think. Let me see, one, two, three, four, yeah, five. After you know, what you're good at and you found your path and you're becoming good at it and you're making friends along the way, your job is to knock on as many doors as you can while you improve and accumulate your portfolio, okay? You enter the doors that resonate with you and what you do and bring you closer to your goal. Ignore 
the ones that will skew you in the wrong direction, okay? Even if it's a super tempting. General rule of thumb for this point is if you don't want to do a job, slap a ridiculous price tag on it, okay? So if you take it, then you'll buy yourself some more free time or opportunities later on with the money that you're going to do, right? But usually when I was starting in freelance, I never took the jobs that didn't lead me to the outcome that I wanted, which is, was visual development, color scripting, story. I hated rendering, so I didn't take illustration jobs on and so on and so forth. All right, build your name and authority to further your career. And you're going to do it by doing excellent work, solving clients' problems, and making their life easier. But don't lose yourself in money and prestige, okay? Authenticity and true love for what you do is the driving force behind your success. People feel that in your work, and that will be the thing that makes you stand out next to other people's works, okay? And you do this until you feel like it's time to grow further. Repeat the same process for your future endeavors, but at least now you have something to fall back on, right? And pull experience from. So if you want to diversify into any other field, you already have experience. And let's say you did this thing for becoming a color scripter, for example, right? And then you want to become an environment artist. You're going to take the experience that you had with color scripting and apply it into an environment art. And yeah, that's the classic path of becoming good at something, uh, building your portfolio of work, accumulating friends and connections along the way, and then, you know, breaking the industry with your first job. In a nutshell, you know, the formula or your path looks like this. Find your talent, develop that talent into a, to a professional level, produce good work and collect it in a place where people can find it. Network with the right people and keep developing your skills until you find your place under the sun and you'll find a stable batch of clients and industry connections. And then you rinse and repeat. If you want to keep like evolving as a creative person, just pick a new topic or a combination of old skills and new skills and repeat, like, repeat this journey. It will become much easier to change directions with previous experience and connections because a lot of creative fundamentals overlap. Uh, you still with me, guys? Are you still with me? Because we're getting to the practical side of things now. Everything that I talked about before is crucial to understand. Like majority of you are still in the beginning stages and still developing your creative voice and working on your craft. Uh, but let's imagine, let's just imagine that you've been at this game for a while. You have somebody, so like you have some... You have some body of work and your art station, you know, you have some hints of an original artistic voice and you want to start earning a full-time living from your creativity and imagination. All right. What are the steps that we can take? All right. Next slide. And we're going into the most important probably part of this topic is the main freelancing principles, right? And, um, and a step-by-step -step guide on how to start monetizing your art. But, but first, let's you know, cover some commonly encountered questions. And what are they? Well, where's that slide? Oh, I need that slide. Technical difficulties. Hello, Hans Zimmer. <laughs> I lost the slide. Oh, here you go. I found it. All right. <laughs> what are... What are the steps, right? Or, you know, or what are the most commonly encountered questions? Number one. Oh, those are not the ones. No, those are the answers. Oh, man. All right. <laughs> Here are they. Here are the questions. I lost the slide. Rip the slide, right? But, okay, what are the mo most common questions? First, you know, how do you know that you're ready? Uh, well, you never read, no you, you never read in, no, to be honest, but a bare minimum that you need is that your work looks as good or slightly worse than work of people that you admire and no work on the same, you know, and your work looks on the, like, it looks slightly worse or, or slightly better or at the same, right? And you need to make sure that, you know, those artists, they work on the same projects that you want to work on, right? And a lot of people ask, 
when is the right time you know when is the right time to start freelancing and the answer is you know when you feel that you want to test your problem solving skills on a real project uh, but remember you will attract the same quality of clients as your portfolio so you know uh, like don't say no to work that could really give you the experience and a nice portfolio piece to further your knowledge and confidence in your abilities. But again, say no to the projects that you know don't benefit your your path. And another common question that usually people have is, um, is how much do I, how, how do I get a highly paid client, and you know how do I get into AAA studios? or AAA studios to reach out to me. And well, the rule of thumb is this. If you want to get paid, let's say, I don't know, 10,000 bucks for your illustration, like storyboard or concept art services in general, produce work that looks like a $10,000 job. <laughs> it's that simple. You are a problem solver, you know, we charge for value, not for pretty images. So more examples of that a little bit later, you know, but again, that's the importance of personal projects. Right. Uh, okay. It's time to start writing things down, guys, because here are the actionable steps that you need to take to make it an in industry. All right. And finally, I can use this slide. Step one. Step one. Let's go. <laughs> know your industry and research it every day. Be hungry for knowledge and specifics. Okay. Find out what professional professions in the industry like the industry has and what problems are there to be solved. I won't be going over all the professions in the VizDev industry today, but if you want to get familiar with them on your own, I suggest you visit my lecture. What is visual development? A lecture number one of the art camp playlist. And then inside of animation pipeline, I think it's lecture three, if I'm not mistaken. It's all free here on my YouTube channel. So there's also bonus material for this lecture on my Discord channel under homework assignments. So here, uh, I also recommend to check it out. It's under homeworks. So if you want to see bonus material, you can go there. But all of those professions, so let's say you, you listen to that lecture, they have something in common. They solve a problem in pre, pro, or post-production pipeline for a project. Uh, specific, it's also solve something for a specific person or specific team, but the general rule of thumb is the same. Um, and you need to understand, you know, where you fit the best. And at the end of the day, it is your call. Uh, you need to know your strong sides and weak sides. I personally love everything pre-production, for example. That's why I do storage and keyframes, color keys, and pitch work with directors before the project even starts. I like the blue sky phase of the project the best because, you know, I hate rendering. I love going far and wide with my imagination and story. And, you know, I, I just like to let my brain wander and see where the story can take me. All right. Step two, networking. Networking and social media. Collect all the resources in people into one place. Over here I have it saying, be a creepy spider. Let me explain. Follow studios you want to work for and people who work for those studios, okay? Compare yourself and then adjust accordingly. Find their YouTube, find their Discord, become a slightly creepy, you know, <laughs> researcher or stalker, you know? Send them cold DMs or email, ask for advice, but make sure it comes from a place of respect and admiration, okay? not neediness and want for validation and attention. Ask them super specific questions. Professionals rarely have time to write you an essay, you know, unless those professionals are me and I just waste my time here. <laughs> right, I'm kidding, I'm not wasting my time, but like keep it short and sweet, preferably start the message, you know, uh, you know, love your work, you know, you're my biggest inspiration and favorite artist, even if it's not the case, you know, but it betters your chances of, you know, the artist answering to you. So yeah, all artists are narcissists and you increase your chance of the message being read, you know, like 500 times if you start with that. 
<laughs> combinations. Or you know what? You can provide value. So for example, a lot of people in this Discord channel, they do um, like mod, mod, mod work for my Discord. And in exchange, I give them a lot of advice. That's the, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's the same rule of value and attention. They provide value. And even though let's say they don't have money to pay for my mentorship, they can provide value in exchange and you know i answer their questions and provide almost free mentorship i don't do it, i don't do it for a lot of people but i do it to people who are like you know what that's a lot of value and i'm willing to exchange my value or my time for your value yeah so yeah and then you can also like hang out in their voice chats messages you know you can message them and or comment on their instagram posts um your job is to become seen on a consistent basis you know you have to be kind of like not an annoying fly but a visible fly <laughs> um, yeah and then every time you reach out to a new company or to a new friend or to a new artist that you really really love you know your job is to be a spider and have your net spread for you know far and wide each spider web is basically like a person connected to another person and you never know sometimes where one connection can lead you in your career. Uh, keep a little document of your connections, right? Where you keep uh, important contact emails, their website, and also people they know. Industry is all about a guy who knows a guy. You never know when one of those spider webs will tingle and lead you to your opportunity. Your job is to keep knocking on doors and spreading spider webs because that's how you get foot in like foot in the door all right again your job is to keep knocking on doors over and over again improving your skill spreading your spider webs far and wide because that's how you get in the industry it's that simple all right i forgot level three. Oh, and we're getting to the level three step three be good and be so good that they can't ignore you okay you need to treat your quote unquote, <laughs> jobless days as your full-time job. You are a professional even if you don't have clients right now. You have to adopt a professional mindset, all right? That's when, right, that's, that's when importance of your personal projects kick in, right? Um, I also made a full-blown two-hour lecture on that topic, so that releases pretty soon here on YouTube channel too. So if you don't want to, uh, and if you don't want to know or if you want to know why you should do your own work, make sure to check out that lecture and uh, yeah, it's going to be uploaded soon. But anyways, remember your main responsibilities when you're doing your personal work is to imitate real life projects and real life problems that the industry usually encounters and then you solve them. And then, you know, you post the quote unquote pretty images or concepts in your portfolio. Like remember images are there as a side effect of your problem solving. It just happens that we do it with our paintings. We're, we are selling value to the client, but in the visual form, all right? Your goal is to be the best of the best in your field. Well, not even the best. You, you need to be only slightly better than average in terms of technical skill, right? Technical skill, but problem solving skill and understanding of the pipeline, you have to be the best, the best of the best, right? And then there comes communicating with the clients and understanding them, but that's topic of our next lecture. I think it's gonna be called, you know, communicating with the client 101 or something like that. I'm not sure yet. Best resource to see how the industry works is watching, you know, making off documentaries for animation and movies and trying to imagine yourself as one of the people you know, <laughs> talking in that video. Uh, and I also have a bunch of documentaries listed in homework channel for the uh, Valhalla camp. So do check it out. I think we have Iron Giant documentary, Ratatouille, The Incredibles, and then something else. But yeah, documentaries, the best way to learn about the industry and understand, you know, what part of the pipeline you want to be in. All right, so to recap, Produce good work, go with that work and knock on doors, okay? Collect feedback, adjust course and repeat that cycle, right? 
repeat that cycle until a door opens and then rinse and repeat. Because every time a door opens, that's a freelance opportunity. Then when it's that freelance opportunity is over, you, again, you start producing good work, knock on doors. If they reject you, you collect feedback, adjust course, produce good work, knock on the door. If they let you in, success, rinse and repeat. Yeah. I also want to add like a bonus tip for people who are already freelancing. Uh, if there's a lot of work as a freelance artist, that's great. But when work stops, there's twice as much work ahead of you. You need to double down on work because NDAs and projects are tricky. Some of them don't even come out. Your personal work is your driving factor of success. All right. Remember that. All right. Next slide. Let's talk about things to avoid. I call it not to do list. All right. In the beginning, your goal is to find your voice as an artist and then find the job market, right? For yourself. You need to see what the job market has to offer to you. Not the way that, not the other way around. All right. I can repeat this again because I already mentioned that in a previous, you know, segment, but I can mention again. Your goal is to find your voice as an artist and then find what the job market has to offer, not the other way around. Don't take jobs too early in your career, right? Because that will, uh, because if you take jobs that will stand in the way of your discovering your creative voice and things that you love, you're gonna screw yourself over. And I know so many people who took the jobs too early in their career and that defined their creative voice and then they found themselves in creative hell, which is working for a studio, projects that they don't like, in the style that they don't like, not knowing what they could have became or become if they would have you know, just invested more time into their own work. Again, only take jobs that are in sync with your goal at the time, right? So an example for me, color scripting was a big thing that I, I discovered later on in my career. And I didn't take any character design work or anything like that. Any environment work, it was always about fast storytelling, fast colors, and fast lighting, right? All right, number two, Upwork or any other horrible freelance hiring website is a no-no in my opinion. All you're doing is competing there, like who can do work the best for a lesser price. And in this way, harming the reputation of other artists down the line and industry in general, not reputation, but even the day rate in, in the day rate in general. And like what we do is hard and takes years of training to do well. People need to understand that and it should be reflected in the price. Okay. So Upwork, doesn't matter how desperate you are. It's better to go have a job at McDonald's then have work on Upwork. Of course, there's some people from other countries who have, you know, lower currencies and stuff like that. Especially for those people, don't get abused by people overseas, all right? Uh, because the industry works like this. If you're going to lowball what it actually costs, that's going to affect other people in America or in Australia or in any, any other place. Because right now, what studios do a lot of the times, they would go and hire you know, cheaper studios overseas and all the work goes away and people provide value, incredible value for a very low pay overseas. And we need to fix that. And we fix it by, well, how? Like for example, you know, of course, art is not brain surgery, but, you know, brain surgery is always expensive. <laughs> it doesn't matter what, what country you're in. Uh, and then same thing with art or with, with any other thing, honestly. There should be an international value tag on it. Well, especially for AAA companies. I'm not talking about indie companies. I'm talking about that, right? So make sure that if you if you use those websites, sorry, I need to get some water. If you use those websites, you're charging uh, an according price. And to know how much you're, how much you're worth or what's your uh, value tag, you need to, again, Ask around. There's some websites around uh, that have uh, industry standards. Uh, in my opinion, like super beginner job should be no less than twenty to twenty-five dollars, right? Fifteen is like bare minimum, no experience whatsoever, right? And then all the way up to like sixty-five an hour, 
that's a good pay rate for a AAA, AA company, 65 an hour. Four, four or five years of experience, that sounds about right. And then there are superstars who can charge much more, more. But what I'm saying with this is when you are undervaluing yourself and underpricing yourself, right? Um, you're screwing, not yourself over, you're screwing the other artists down the line, right? So don't underbid or undervalue yourself by doing this. You're not, again, you're not screwing yourself over, but the other artists down the line, right? And, you know, the final one, my favorite one, don't give up. Uh, you know, I'm going to say it right now, AI or any other reason that might be standing in in the way between you and your creative careers is not a good reason enough to quit and not pursue your dream job, um, right? I'm probably gonna record a separate lecture regarding AI, but the bottom line is this. Yes, industry is changing, but you won't be replaced. Yes, there's plenty of jobs and yes, it is possible to get in. And there's always a way to somehow build a monetization system around your lifestyle, right? But we're going to talk about that probably in later lectures because this one is probably more about like ultimate freelancing guide 101. Of course, there's self-employed artists and there's a lot of branches of monetization systems that deviate from the regular monetization systems. And I think it, deserve, it, it deserves like a separate lecture. Um, yeah. So, you know what? In conclusion... This is my favorite emoji. You can do it. <laughs> right. Um, in conclusion, you know, monetizing your art and creative skills is not an easy task. It's not an easy task at all. But it is possible if you have a solid understanding of how the entertainment industry works and the value and attention concept. It is important to find your passion and dedicate yourself to it becoming the best problem solver in that field. Building your portfolio and networking with people in the industry is crucial for, you know, for your success, right? And remember, the journey to becoming a successful artist is is a forever changing and morphing, you know, thing and you know, you never know where it might take you. You know, keep learning, keep growing and keep following your passions. Um, yeah. Keep learning keep growing and keep following your passions. I think that's it for today. I, you know, I hope you found this valuable and I hope even more that, you know, you'll implement the things I talked about and integrate them into your life. So, and I hope this information won't fall on deaf ears. If you found this useful, you know, please send this to a person who might benefit from this also. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, leave a comment if you want. Uh, yeah, or leave, you know, maybe a topic for the next lecture. I listen very carefully to my students and yeah, join our Discord because this lecture that you're listening to is currently held live on our Discord channel with a bunch of epic Vikings talking live in a little chat box <laughs> next to the West channel. Um, yeah. All right. Time for questions and answers from the Discord channel people. Uh, yeah, raise your hand as usual or leave a message in the box with a big word question in the beginning and I'll read it and answer it. I think we have maybe five questions for today since this was pretty dense lecture, but we'll see. And uh, yeah, questions and answers time. Let's go. Do 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 do. All right, let's see. Let's see. Of course, of course, I have like five DMs while I'm doing my lecture. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. There. Um, ba -ba 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 -bum. let's see, let's see, let's see, uh, where's the lecture questions? All right. Question. Do you think going to make connections and feedback at events like Lightbox is worse for someone who is not very experienced and lives very far from yes or similar? 
All right. Thank you for the question, Maki. Um, I went to, I think, CTNX once. I think if you don't have a body of work, it's pretty useless for you to go there. All the information that you can find can be found online. Plus, it's very expensive. It's at least two to three thousand dollars to go there. Okay, maybe fifteen hundred if you're very frugal, right? The tickets, the the hotel, and then uh, the the most inspirational thing about it is you can get inspiration there. You can accumulate some friends who are probably on the same level as you. And there's a small chance maybe someone can take you under your wing, but you have to be really good with like communicating and you know giving your email. There's nothing better than you know talking to people directly and then giving your contact information because they're more likely to respond. But in my opinion, it's better to spend, let's say, that fifteen hundred dollars on a private mentor, for example. Right, so a lot of Pixar people, uh, like uh, I, for example, and then some of my friends who do mentorships, they they charge any, anywhere from five hundred to nine hundred, right? And for you can technically buy two mentorships for that money from a person who lives in the industry. Plus, ask them directly how to get a job. And most of the time, if you do a good job through the mentorships, right, uh, the person that you took the mentorship from will actually most of the time can share jobs with you or even recommend you so in my opinion value versus money relationship lightbox is valuable if you have a body of work and everything that and then you already have connections in the industry and then you took a bunch of steps into like how to get a job and you want to level up to like big boys league right so you're right now you're in double A, single A, you want to get into triple A, and then you want to go and target like, hey, there's a recruiter for Pixar there, and I want to be there because yes. And there's going to be this guy who I want to talk to and get specific information to. Because in my opinion, going to Lightbox just to hang out is too expensive. I can't justify it. Um, yeah, so hopefully that uh, answers your question. And that was question number uno. All right, question. Do you think is a good idea to make character concept art, even if the market's oversaturated and, and companies don't see value in it. <sighs> All right, from practical standpoint and from pain standpoint, I don't recommend becoming character designers. Yes, market is oversaturated. And the first thing that is gonna get automated is with, let's say AI, for example, we're gonna cover that project later on is characters because that's the most common thing that we see in art and it's the that's the most knowledge that the AI can collect onto but don't get discouraged right because again AI is probably going to become a tool that artists use not everybody else is not going to replace us it's going to be probably become part of our pipeline in terms of it's like photo bashing or advanced ref searching what part of the character design that is not going to be probably replaced is uh, shape design super stylized characters because AI is just horrible it is really really bad at recognizing stylized shapes and action slash acting driven characters so you know those animation sheets that you see in visual development uh, portfolios sometimes right so anything that has you know expressiveness in it, very stylized shape design, and all of that is going to be hard to replace by AI. When, we, when it comes to movies, I think the movie people, most of their stuff was already 3D. Like they had, you know, they had a 3D mock-up of a character, then they will photo bash some, you know, pictures on top, then they would have a big library of their own personal pictures of like clothes, then they would bash stuff on top, and then they would paint over. So with movie industry or character design, you know who really screwed is people who generate, you know, just anime girls because <laughs> that's it. But in my opinion, if you really love it and you like it and you want to do it, stick to it. You just need to find, okay, what value can I provide? If if I can provide value of, you know, design, can I provide value of how it's painted? Is it going to be like, 
uh, is it going to be beneficial to a 3D artist? I can do design callouts better. You have to understand that, okay, if you are in a competitive environment, what's your main selling point, right? And if your main selling point is just, I'm a good character designer, that's not good enough. Uh, usually it comes with something like, hey, I not only can design a character in a turnaround, but I can also provide an expressive sheet that is going to be amazing for the animators. Plus, like, I don't know, I'm really good with story or something like that. You you fill in the blanks. But uh, general rule of thumb, if you like it, you should do it. Um, yeah. All right. Next question. Hopefully I answered it. Is it bad to get stuck in a certain art style too early? Should I try to diversify more? Hmm. That's a great question. I think for every person, it's different. Style is... Again, uh, style is like manner of speaking. You know, you can talk like me in a weird way or you can talk like a normal person, but we still get the information across. It doesn't matter if I'm a little bit cringe and the other person is like has a British accent and a perfect speech pattern, right? So same thing with art style. Art style is a language that you use to express ideas and get the information across. So doesn't matter what art language you use as long as it you know acceptable within uh, the niche that you're producing for i think the main you know main questions should be what's the story you know what's the simple statement where's the focal point how am i trying to make my audience feel and then your style is something that evolves you know evolves naturally and some artists, I have multiple styles. I have completely different style in traditional than to, you know, digital. Uh, and, you know, I speak two languages, Russian and English. And, you know, some of my mannerisms are slightly different in Russian than in English. But the main point is usually the same. I want to be good to other people. I want to be helpful. I want to get the information across. Is it English or Russian? Doesn't matter. Is it one style or another? Doesn't matter gets the point across it's a language hopefully i answered that one too all right i wanted to thank you insanely for your videos and lectures they're very motivating to work further and give such important faith in the future oh thank you dartush it's uh you know what guys i do need words of encouragement sometimes and maybe even more than you <laughs> uh, we are a good team i encourage you you encourage me Oh, good. All right, question. What do you do when you're running a deadline and your work isn't turning out as well as you hoped? Uh, your character or environment art isn't looking elegant, aesthetic, in accordance to the commission. So you're in a self-loathing phase where you question whatever you qualify for the job. Ooh, surfy. <laughs> All right, I can tell you a story, guys. Last Monday, no, last Friday to Wednesday, I had a freelance job. It was a pretty intense one over the weekends, as usually with Borg Pena. Can't say what it was, but I can say to this. The deadline was intense. Um, I had to do a lot of, I had to do four keyframes for an unspecified project, okay? Under NDA. Can't spill the beans, sorry. But, 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 but. First day, I did a bunch of sketches and they all got rejected. So I'm already on a timer, four keyframes in three days now, okay? On Monday, I do a keyframe. Oh yeah, no, you know what? One sketch got chosen. It was the, it was, I thought it was the crappiest sketch. And as usual, the crappiest sketch gets picked over other ones. That was the only one that was approved. So on Monday, I had to do three more. Well, I had to revisit the crappy sketch that I thought and I had to do three more. And then I had to actually paint a painting and send it. I work his way for approval and it was kind of approved but still with notes on second day I had to do two more paintings and one of them got denied and on day three I basically had you know I, I stayed until probably like 7 a.m. the same day woke up at 5 and stayed up till 7 a.m. and I pulled through and the entire time when I was doing those things under insane pressure I was second guessing my every decision and the problem with that is it's called the imposter syndrome Every time an important project comes your way, you start reinventing the wheel. You're like, you know what? How would this person would 
do this painting or how would this person like what if and the problem is you you ask the wrong questions right you are asking yourself how am i going to be another person right and then you stop believing in yourself and uh, the main thing is you gotta like you do how you do it stuff uh, you, you do your stuff how you would do your stuff okay no questions asked just do it and you forget that it's a for a client you forget for this you you set yourself a goal and you just do it because the other questions are absolutely you know they're useless and as you go yes there's certain quality that you're used to and you think you can do better in your head but your client doesn't know that your client sees a painting and reacts to the painting. Your client doesn't react to 10 potential paintings in your head that could have turned out from that painting, okay? And the client doesn't need to know that. Only you know that. And you know the general th rule of thumb? A week later, when you look back at those paintings, you're going to be like, you know what? They weren't that bad. You weren't that bad at all. And that happened to me. You know, I, I was like, how would I... You know, I have a friend, Toby, who's amazing. And I would, I, I asked myself, how would Toby would paint those paintings? You know, Borja really likes Toby paintings. But then I was like, you know what? Borja hired me because I am who I am. You know what? And this thing is limiting, is limiting my painting potential. So you know what? I turned my brain off and I started doodling. And the moment I turned my brain off, listened to music and just sat down for three to four hours, amazing paintings started coming out, out of my, uh, <laughs> out of my head. Okay. Amazing paintings start <laughs> coming out, out of my head. Man, English second language, tough sometimes, brain fart. All right. Um, yeah, and that's how you deal with it. Uh, have grace upon yourself, you know. Uh, take things easy. Take a step back. Ask yourself, how would I paint this painting? How I would make this fun to do for myself? And you just do it. And then you, you say, finish, not perfect. It's the best that I can do in the amount of time that is given. And I provided more value than they asked for in, in this amount of time. It is the best work that I can do. It's pretty close. But you know what? Perfection is limitless. You know, a lot of people are, you know, perfection kills a lot of momentum. And then people just stop creating and then they're just paralyzed by perfectionism. So in my opinion, loosen up. You know, you're not going to die if a painting is going to turn out bad and if you're not going to make mistakes there's nothing to fix and if there's nothing to fix you're not going to come to a finished painting okay so hopefully that is useful all right we have maybe two or maybe one or two more questions hopefully i answered your question um surfy all right question how to get into the industry if you have no experience at all only courses study works in the portfolio yes or no if there's nothing else besides them, is it worth knocking on the doors? No. No, it's not worth it. Sorry. Uh, why? But I need to be, I want to save you some time. Because when you provide just studies, there's such thing as student portfolio. I can smell it from 10 miles away. Recruiters can smell it from 10 miles away. Yes, sometimes your studies can be so good, especially if you show perspective, design, everything else. But in my opinion, you should have like 85, 90% your personal work and then 10% studies in there. And only studies that show a specific problem-solving skills like perspective, you know, color and different lighting scenarios, master studies maybe that you can adopt to different styles. Right, uh, because recruiters they they trying to see if you are equipped for their task, and your portfolio again it should be pretty in terms of technical skill. But the most important thing is that you are you can solve different problems, like you can do anatomy. Great. What what problem are you solving? If you have anatomy and then ten posts with character designs with great gestures. Right. Again, studies usually are an add-on to your personal work. So, for example, you have personal work and then you show a progress of like, hey, and then in between my character designs, I did a gesture study session. And they're like, oh, they know what gesture is. Great. Right. But then if you only have gestures, you what it's called a study artist and study artists don't get jobs. OK. Artists with personal voices and personal projects, again, 
that lecture is coming on soon onto YouTube. We watch that. Only artists with personal projects and personal voices stand out from the crowd. If you don't have a personal voice or a personal project, you have to be a really good draftsman and be like amazing you know, at this particular thing. And there's people like that, but my personal philosophy, and could be wrong, so uh, don't might take my word for it, you know, uh, trust it only if you want, is, you know, personal heart, personal voice, uh, you know, every little beat of your soul that you put into your art is what makes you special. Uh, and, you know, a lot of industry professionals don't agree with me on that regard, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's my truth. All right. Okay, question. Do you think animation industry is easier to get into than illustrating character designs? Is there more space? Um, I say this. Um, again, if you get the idea of value and attention, almost any style and anything can get monetized. It de you just need to find your audience. With, with art and visual development in the animation industry in general, there's just much more steps to get to the final product, which is animation, right? Every prop, every character, every vehicle, every environment, uh, every mood, every story beat has to be designed through character design, environment design, color keying or storyboarding, and on and on and on. And then it has to be 3D modeled. 3D modeled, that means you have to explain how it works. So you need to have character design call out. It just, in animation or movies, there's just, it's a big machine that has a lot of things in it that can be monetized by us, which is different professions. Again, rewatch what is visual development uh, to understand that more. You know, there's character designs, depending on the project, the project can have many character designs and then a bunch of background people. Uh, you know, a movie can be, you know, placed in the desert with no background people. And then there has to be one character designer who creates the main character, for example. Maybe one creature designer, right? Uh, it depends on the project. Let's say Zootopia probably needs a bunch of character designers, right? So anyways, what is visual development video? Please watch it. All the information is there. But the bottom line is some of those professions are more required. So for example, how many environments do you encounter in a movie and how many characters? The answer is hundreds, if not thousands of environments in a movie or a game, and then you know a dozen character. What about props? Props. Prop design, you need to have thousands of props. Characters, a dozen. Right? Color scripting, you know while doing animation stuff, thousands of frames, and every time it's needed. Keyframe art. You need, to, you need to have less keyframe artists on a production, two or three maybe, but if you're the best at it, you'll get hired, right? What about storyboarding? Storyboarding, you know, de depending on the project, uh, you know, a movie can have up to 10 storyboard artists or just one story artist. Again, it all depends, but the bottom line is this, you know, follow what interest you okay and stick to it and become best at it and the question is can it be monetizable or profitable that's for you to answer you know you need to see if you fit in an industry if for example you're super niche like i only design you know zombie fishes there's probably could be a problem for you on the market <laughs> right how many projects need or you know what you wait until a perfect zombie fish you know, project evolves. You know what I'm saying? Or you go the indie route and you create, I don't know, your NFT connect collection. I hate NFTs, but that's one of the examples, right? Or you create a toy line with your zombie things and then you create a following of people who like your art in general. So uh, again, the bottom line is, as, 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 as in the lecture, anything can be monetized as long as people see value in it. To how, to how many and to how much people, that's a different, that's a different question. All right. All right. And I think that's a wrap, guys. Thank you for, you know, thank you for joining. Oh, okay. One second. There's a very important question in the chat. And it's what kind of beer do you like? <laughs> I don't drink beer. I don't drink at all. I don't do drugs. I do vape, though. But trying to quit that. Uh, I also quit smoking. It's uh, 
I'm into it week two, so fingers crossed for me. But I like a, what is it called, soft drink. I'm not sure if it's soft drink, it was, I'm not sure. It's called Mikey's or Mike's. That's like, I don't know, a 2% lemonade with some extra spicy alcohol in it. Uh, I don't think you can even get drunk from it. So that's my favorite beer. And uh, my favorite uh, drink after that is peach juice. I love peach juice. So anyways, um, cheers, my Vikings. You're the best. Remember, remember one thing. You can do it. You can do this. I believe in you. And, you know, if you have any more questions, just please write in the chat. Suggest that our next lecture, um, our next lecture is going to be communicating 101 with our clients and with other people. So I'll start my preparation for it immediately for next week. Um, yeah, yeah. And I believe in you guys. It's not that hard. Just have fun while you do it, okay? Have fun. You can do it. Don't give up. You're true Vikings. All right. Remember, Valha is for artists. Uh, you're the best. Love you guys. Bye-bye. Share this lecture around, all that stuff, and, you know, wait for the recording. Aya! Ta-da!